Christian Church, Life in the Word, with our pastor, Dr. Gabriel Rogers, Sr. talking about that and uh, if you streamed me in Houston you saw me break open a revelation that uh, I'm going to push into a a little bit thicker tonight so if you heard me preach down there I don't want you to say "Ah, I know that one I got it no no you don't have it (laughs) stay with me okay Uh, because even if you heard a message how many know uh, if if I preached it the exact same way again you still going to get more out of it yeah but tonight, there are some curves in this, as I've continued to meditate it, that's even going to give you fresh insight and new wisdom relative to this concept. So I'm talking faith technicalities, and we know our bedrock scripture had been 2 Peter 1 and 3, as his divine power has given us how many things? All things that what? Pertain to life and godliness. But how are we going to get it, class? Through the knowledge. Come on, y'all got to help me tonight. I said, how are we going to get it, class? Through the knowledge. Does it come by osmosis? No. no. Does it come just because you uh, think it might be something that's going to come? No, you got to learn of it. You got to get the knowledge of it. Jesus said, my, uh, uh, my, take my yoke and learn of me. Learn of me. There are things about God that we need to learn in order to be able to activate it. So I understand tonight, amen, that people aren't healed, amen, Denise, just because I pray for them. Amen. Because the book of James says that I must pray the prayer of faith in order to get people healed. Amen. Uh, Acts 3.16, by faith in the name of Jesus has this man walked. So he didn't just walk just because I said Jesus. When I said the name of Jesus, I had to say the name of Jesus how? In faith. Faith. Faith is what makes it go. I don't know who coined this phrase years ago. But I can't tell you I disagree with it. Prayer is the key, but faith unlocks the door. You pray, but you got to pray in faith. Amen. So with that in mind, I'm going to talk about something that I know is going to bless you tonight. I think you're going to enjoy it. And uh, the technicality that I want to deal with tonight is called greater harvesting. Because I've been burdened about that as of late. I've been burdened about the people of God harvesting. And more specifically, I want to show you my theme verse over in Haggai chapter 2, verse number 9. And then we're going to operationally define what I mean by harvesting tonight. There are a lot of things you can harvest, and I think you can apply this message in many different areas. But I'm going to show you specifically, Jeff, what I'm going to be pressing on tonight so that you are without mystery on what we are referring to. Amen. Are we off to a good start? Yeah, so I'm going to deal with uh, greater harvesting, but here is my subject relative to greater harvesting. Uh, Haggai, the prophet, to the people uh, who were building Zerubbabel's temple, who worked with Ezra and and others at the time, he he stands up and he asks a question that I think we should all ask ourselves tonight. And I will not get to all of these points uh, to show you what we really, really mean about that, because I'm going to spend some time in another passage. But Haggai does give us the right question. Haggai 2 and 19, Brother Haggai says, is the seed still in the barn? (laughs) Will you say that with me tonight? Is the seed still in the barn? Why do you ask that rhetorically? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. So in other words, the thing that you plant it for is up, the tree is up, but there are no figs on the tree, there are olives on the tree to the magnitude by which we want to harvest it. It has not yet yielded fruit, but everybody say the grace of God. Somebody say God's getting ready to catch me up. But from this day, I will bless you. 
Boy, that's good news. Every seed that you've sown relative to the harvest of whatever it was, how many of y'all know from this day forward, God's going to catch you up? Amen. Amen. God's getting ready to catch me up. He getting ready to put his super on my natural. Somebody say amen. He going to put the blessing on what I've been doing by faith, and God's getting ready to catch me up. The tree is up. Amen. Yet there is no fruit on the tree. So we understand that the question of is the seed still in the barn is a very assumption, not assumption, but, uh, but nudging question that, that the prophet is asking the people. Now, wait a minute, is the seed still in the barn? <laughs> Amen. Almost rhetorical. Is it, is it that you've not planted any seeds, that you don't have a crop yet? Is the seed still in the barn? And then you could take that question literally. Is the seed still in the barn? We'll talk about that later, if not tonight, another night. Have you yet to plant? Because he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. He who sows sparingly will what? Reap sparingly. But if the seed is still in the barn, why are you expecting a crop? Right? So we're going to deal with that, if not tonight, another night. But in many cases, as he is asking somewhat of a nudging question, uh, a suggestive question, I could say it that way. Uh, In many cases, the seed is not in the barn. It's just that the things that have come up have not yielded the way that you and I want it to yield. Would you agree with that? It's not brought forth the fruit yet that we want to see in our life. And there are some things that are organic, But then there's some things, meaning organic, they just kind of produce on their own. But there's some things we got to cultivate in order to get a greater harvest. There's some things you got to keep weeds from around it. You got to keep fertilizer on it. You got to do some other things to harvest that crop. So if you would, uh, Sambu, would you please put Haggai 1 and 6 on the screen? and the translation that, that I gave you all earlier. And let's just take this first line phrase. Let, let's not worry about the other portions tonight because I'm not going to get into that piece. But Haggai 1 and 6, you guys had it right. The Bible says, you have planted much, but what? Harvested, harvested how? Little. You planted much, but harvested little. little. Now that is the anointed statement of the night. Same Haggai. Same, same teacher, same prophetic person, same voice in context to the book of Haggai. He tells the people of God, you've planted much, but harvested little. Now, those of you who know this story, you understand around verse number four, he talks about considering your ways. And one of the reasons why they had not harvest is they were selfish. They were building their own kingdom while God's kingdom was lying in ruin. Amen. Amen. And we'll deal with that on another night, the Lord allow. That's not where he's pressing on me tonight. But I do want to borrow this phrase, PJ, because I believe it is a phrase that defines how many of you in this room feel tonight. That phrase that I've planted much, but harvested little. So with that in mind, Pastor, which harvest, what kinds of crops are you referring to? Because if we planted much and I've not got the harvest that uh, I think I ought to have by now, let's operationally define. Are y'all still with me? What kind of harvest I'm referring to all night long specifically. I'm talking about bringing in primarily the crops of souls. The crops of souls. How many people in here can honestly say, don't raise your hand if you can't honestly say it, but that you have shared the gospel with somebody this month? Okay, very good. So then if I planted those seeds of evangelism, those seeds of sharing Christ with somebody, those seeds of inviting somebody to church, and they have not yet come to church, this phrase applies to me. Because I planted much, but I harvested little. I just looked at one of the young men in the church tonight that I planted the seed of evangelism in a few weeks ago, and he's here tonight. So that would then qualify me to teach this. What do you think? I was up in the youth zone earlier tonight, and one of the first people I saw when I went into the building was a 16-year-old young man I met out there who came. 
He's actually up there tonight. So that would qualify me to teach this. Would you agree? That must mean I know a little bit about how to get somebody not only to church, but to stay at church. I, I know a little. Is this okay? Dave said teach. Thank you, Dave. And I'm not saying that arrogantly, I say it humbly, but I believe at a certain point, amen, if I want to learn how to be a surgeon, I need to find a good surgeon. Amen. I need to be an internist under a surgeon. I want to be, Shante, I want to be a lawyer. You know, I'd look you up. I said, man, you've been lawyering for many years. Can you tell me how to sit on a bench, what to say, what not to say? Can you tell me how to do research in law? What should I do, right? So at a certain point, we need some specialists to begin to speak up on what they're doing right so that others can begin to do the same thing who really want to do it. Because you're not going to win a soul just because you share a church card. Because the truth is, some of the people, <laughs> look at another one of mine just walking in. This is such a sign, wonder, and a miracle. Some of the people that we minister to and invite and bring into the kingdom of God, we're going to have to be persistent and diligent in order to get them here on the night by which we want them here and give them the opportunity to make a choice. That doesn't mean they'll stay forever, but it does mean that they would have been exposed to a church of integrity. They've been exposed to the gospel. They've been exposed to spirit-filled living, and they can make a choice. And hopefully, the choice will be to stay in the kingdom of God, in this church, and as Peter said, grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Can I take my time tonight? So there are two kinds of crops both of which I believe I'm qualified to teach tonight in a most humble way to help you to beef up how you do what you do. Everybody say greater harvesting. Greater harvesting. Amen. Somebody asked the question, is the seed still in the barn? The yeah. Well, what is the other operational definition of harvesting? Money. Tonight, we're going to talk about both simultaneously. Money. Now, I must say that many of you in this room will not qualify for being bad money harvesters because the truth is, I was there when you got your salary doubled. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say we're not going to forget what the Lord already did now. We're not going to forget what God already brought many of us into. Amen. I'm looking at people in the room right now who are on their fourth house since I met them. Amen. Whose salary has quadrupled. The list goes on and on and on. So the truth is, there are many of you in this room who know how to do this to a degree but tonight's lesson, amen, is going to enhance you because we're not just talking about harvesting finances and money. We're talking about greater harvesting. Amen. Is that okay tonight? Amen. So can we talk about both at the same time? Amen. So the truth is, when we start talking about the harvest, I want you to write this down and they will put it on the screen because the Bible says you sow much but reap little. Harvest is in the problem. Harvest is in the problem. Find your problem and solve it, and it will make you rich. Harvest is in the problem. The sick have need of physician. Find your problem and solve it, and it will make you rich. Now, I know that's a run-on sentence, but it makes sense to you. Harvest is in the problem. The sick have need of a physician. Do you understand a hospital goes broke if nobody's sick? But most of them are very lucrative. Why? Because they found problems of sick people. The sick have need of what? Physician. Find your problem and solve it. And what's going to be the outcome, class? It's going to make you rich. Rich how? Rich in souls in the kingdom? You'll be just like Pastor Gabe, be able to look in every section of the church and identify 10 people that you brought in. It'll make you rich in souls. It will most certainly make you rich financially because when you solve a problem, as you will soon learn tonight, amen, you qualify for what we call, for, call supply and demand. Supply and demand. People want something that they either need or really desire. So you solve that problem and amen, your coffers went up as a result. So let's just keep walking through that because... Um, the Bible says in Matthew 9, verse number 10, that it happened that as Jesus sat at the table, they'll put it on the screen, in the house, Matthew 9 and verse number 10, that behold, everybody say many. many. Come on, say it again, many. many. 
Everybody say a bumper crop. Many tax collectors and sinners, plural, came and sat down with him and his disciples. Stop right there. Revelation. Why did all of these publicans and sinners flock to Jesus? Jesus just sat down. But the Bible said many came and sat down with him. Well, I will give you the background as to why they sat down with him. Jesus had one Matthew, who himself was a publican and tax collector and a bad guy in his own right. And by Matthew chapter 9, Matthew simply introduced Jesus to his friends. Jesus is sitting down with Matthew's fear of influence. Your friends won't know about Pastor Gabe if you don't tell them. <laughs> he is simply sitting down with the people that Matthew influenced to sit down with Jesus. I can influence but a few, but the people of God, the sheep that beget sheep, all have friends and influences that if you influence them into the kingdom of God, encourage them and massage them and bring them to the bookstore and massage them up to the cafe building and massage them to all of the wonderful delicatessens that your campus has and your ministry has and your life group has and remind them of when service starts before it starts, hint, hint, and call somebody the day of Bible study. Come on, somebody. And remind somebody of the fact that you got a marriage conference coming up. I'm going to ask a very, amen, how can I say it, <laughs> simple question. I'll keep it that way. Do you know anybody that has marriage problems? Do you know anybody? There, okay, very good. So, simple question. If I know somebody that has marriage problems, remember we solving problems, right? And my church has a marriage conference coming up. What should be my agenda for the next two weeks? Persuading men. You have got to come Thursday night. He's releasing a new book on Friday night. You have got to be there. You have got to get there. They're going to be getting people healed on Wednesday night. The Lord say the same. You got to be there. You got to be a part of what God is doing. That's what Jesus did with Matthew. Matthew's friends were who Jesus sat with. And the truth is, y'all, he sat with how many of his friends? Thank y'all, many. Guys, you got many people that should be coming into the kingdom of God because of your sphere of influence, because of who you can impact. Is that not good? So he sat down with many tax collectors and sinners, and they sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said to them, those who are well have what? No need of a physician. Y'all ain't going to say nothing tonight. Those who are well have no need for a physician. Are you all getting this tonight? What pedigree of people are you after to get into the kingdom of God? Because y'all know we like to win people that smell good. Because you don't want nobody sitting next to you that might reek like the street. But can you tolerate somebody sitting next to you one night that might reek like the street and then go take them down to the neighborhood Goodwill the next day or better stay at the mall and buy them three new outfits out of your own money? Amen. Give them a bar of soap. James said, meet the need. Can you meet the need for somebody, give them a sandwich, build them up, strengthen their dignity, take them to the same barber you go to and bring them back on Sunday? Then you won't have to worry about them not smelling good the whole service. Because those who have already got it together don't need a doctor. The only time you go to a doctor when you got it together is for your annual physical. Are you all getting this? But when you decide to go to urgent care, the emergency room, or wherever else you're going to go, you go because they have something you need. It's called pain-free. Right. It's called, I don't like the way I feel. Well, newsflash, the world does not like the way they feel. Yeah. 
They do not like what they're going through. Make no mistake, don't curse the darkness. The LGBT community and any other lying, stealing, cheating community, adulterous community, drinking community does not like themselves. And like scripture says, their soul knows this well. On the inside, they know they're not satisfied. Boy, I'm teaching good tonight. It's not an adulterer in the world, especially those who came out of the church that can conveniently go sleep with somebody else's spouse and get up like nothing happened. They feel the conviction of God. They feel horrible. They know they're not right. The way that they feel during the sexual encounter is incompatible with the damnation they feel for the next 11 days. And they need you to come out and extend the olive branch and pull them into the kingdom of God. They are sick. And the sick have need a physician. Don't worry, I'm going to get to your pocketbook tonight, but can we do first things first? Because if you seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, how many of you know all these things will be what? Added unto them. But go and learn what this means, Jesus says. He says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus said, I don't want to have your vain sacrifices. I don't want the things that you think you can give me. I desire you to start mastering how to be merciful, how to meet somebody where they are, how to how to have time for somebody, how to really understand that Christianity is not just about me, my four and no more. It's not just about your new closing. I thank God for that. I pray you close on your 16th house before the year is up. I hope you get promoted tomorrow morning, which is exactly what God wants because Psalm 35, 27, he takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants who favor his righteous cause. Everybody say prosperity is not the problem. Prosperity. Amen. But what's pastor's favorite slogan? Can you do Two, two things. Can you do two things at the same time? Can you begin to master? But God, I want to please you. And I understand that heaven rejoices over one soul. So I'm going to get busy about my father's business. And I promise you, KCC, I'm going to teach it until it happens. Because faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And God said, I don't desire mercy. I don't desire sacrifices. I desire for you to become more merciful for a falling generation. Chances are, and I could be wrong, if somebody in America dies every 30 seconds, that implies that somebody in every state today went to hell. That's what it means. Because the Bible says that uh, hell enlarges itself daily. So that means somebody I could have gotten to, potentially, who was sitting two tables away from me in Chili's or whatever restaurant, your favorite restaurant is Chima's. Pick your, pick your place, right? Somebody that was right there that God said, minister to that person right there, and you just did not have time. You just, you didn't have mercy. Thank you for watching this week's broadcast of Kingdom Christian Church, Life in the Word, with our pastor, Dr. Gabriel Rogers C. And now, stay tuned for a special message. Well, God bless you, my friend. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's broadcast. And I want to keep this message of salvation so simple. Did you know that tomorrow is not promised you? Did you know that the rapture could occur and or your life could end? Amen. And so I want to invite you to accept Jesus as Lord of your life right now. As you can tell by all that's going on in the world, things have changed dramatically and the end is very, very near. And so it's time for us to have our house in order and to have Jesus in our heart and to make him Lord of our life. So I want you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me and I believe you rose from the dead for me. So I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart, Jesus Christ, as Lord of my life. As a result of this prayer, I am saved. There you go. Amen. What's your next step? Call this prayer line, this number that you see on the screen. 
We want to pray with you. We want to get you connected to the church. Amen. We want to get you in line with uh, your purpose in God. And most importantly, we want to help you to preserve this salvation moment that you just had. This is the most most important excuse me, decision that you could ever make. So congratulations. As we always say, welcome to the family of God. We look forward to hearing from you. And we're so glad that if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it in your heart, that we will see you in heaven. But we hope to see you before then. Call us today so that you can get tapped into some discipleship. God bless you. And as always, remember, Jesus is coming back real soon. Take care. If you enjoyed today's broadcast and would like to order a copy of the full message, simply visit our website, kingdomchristianchurch.org, and click on the Shop tab to place your order today. They signal to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. You are the partners in the other boat. At Kingdom Christian Church, we are making significant kingdom impact by touching thousands of people each week with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Many have come to the saving grace of our Lord through the preached word and through the empowering ministries of our church. We invite you today to become a kingdom partner. As a kingdom partner, your financial support will help us to further spread the gospel of Jesus Christ through building acquisitions like the Grace House for Ladies and Unwed Moms, daily television, and other various opportunities for discipleship. To become a partner today, simply scan the QR code on the screen or visit our website and click on Become a Partner to complete a short form. As a Kingdom Partner, you will receive our monthly partner newsletter as well as updates regarding the ministry's latest events. You will also receive the greatest benefit of partnership, which is the consistent prayer from our pastor, Dr. Gabriel Rogers and the KCC family. We pray you will receive a 100-fold return on your giving. Sign up today to receive your free gift for partnering with us. And as always, remember, Jesus is coming back real soon. Announcing the release of Dr. Rogers' latest book, 10 Tests of Success, now available for purchase, hard copy, or ebook. In this book, Dr. Rogers identifies 10 character development tests that, if consistently passed, will lead to sustainable success in the life that God designed for you. He explains what it really takes to experience the good success that God has prescribed for every Christian. To purchase your copy, scan the QR code or visit drgabrielrogers.com to order today. If you have a gift for music and are located in the Charlotte area, Kingdom Christian Church is in pursuit of musicians to serve as a drummer, organist, keyboardist, and bass player to supplement our worship service. If you are interested, please contact us by phone at 704-649-2232 or by email at info at kingdomchristianchurch.org. 